Good evening, I'm Mayor Eric Garcetti, and welcome to Asia Society Southern California's 2016 Gala. This year marks the 60th anniversary of Asia Society's founding. That's six decades of strengthening partnerships between Asia and the United States, in everything from arts and culture to business and public policy. I want to congratulate you on that incredible milestone, as tonight we honor some outstanding people who exemplify that commitment to partnership across the Pacific. My dear friends Shirley and Walter Wang, the incredible Michael Govan, and the indomitable Richard Drobnik. Thank you all so much for your amazing work to build bridges, to foster understanding and cooperation, and to help bring people together. And I cannot think of another place that better embodies the power of international partnerships than here in the City of Angels. Here we are the most diverse collection of people in the history of the world, and that diversity is the heartbeat of this city. It's why LA is a hub of trade, travel, and cultural exchange between Asia and the United States. Because while some may think of Asia as the Far East, to us it's always been the Near West. And the future of that close relationship depends on our young people, which is why I'm so proud that we have already reached the 10th anniversary of the Asia 21 Young Leaders Program. I was in the inaugural class of that program, and let me tell you, it is impossible to overstate the power of a network that today spans more than 30 countries and has certainly touched my life. This partnership will help define the 21st century, and we all have a role to play in helping it grow. That's why the work of Asia Society Southern California is so vital. So thank you for allowing me to be a part of this amazing celebration. Keep up your great work and enjoy the rest of the evening. And now we begin our awards. Welcome to the stage a man who is deeply committed to both education and philanthropy. He's both a USC trustee and a powerful advocate for charitable giving. He likes to say he isn't leaving anything substantial to his children. That's the spirit. Please welcome Asia Society Global Co-Chair Ronnie Chan. Thank you, Sandra. It is truly a pleasure to be here, back in the city where I spent 16 years of my life. Although I now live in Hong Kong, there's always a part of me who is here in Los Angeles. You may not know this, the mayor, uh, he, the reason he is so close to the Asia Society is because he's actually one of the Asia 21 fellows. These are the young leaders under age 40 or 45 who are chosen from around Asia as well as North America and that's why he is a friend of ours. Well, anyway, it great, gives me great pleasure to uh, be here. But before I do anything, uh, since Sandra mentioned that I'm a trustee of uh, USC, I should say that I thought the band tonight was really, really good. Don't you think so, ladies and gentlemen? Let's give him a big round of applause. Now I know that the UCLA band is very, very good. As good as the USC one at least for tonight. <laughs> anyway, uh, it, is, it gives me a lot of pleasure to introduce to you the first honoree for this evening. In 1960, a young man, 15-year-old, somewhere in the boonies in uh, Massachusetts, welcomed Jack Kennedy, the young senator. And he said, the last word he said to Jack was, Senator, good luck. A few months later, that gentleman moved into the White House and started a thing called the Peace Corps. In 1967, Professor Dick Dropnik became one of the earliest Peace Corps volunteers. He went to Malaysia, served there, worked there in the farms, and that changed his life. And through his life, many other lives, history show, would have been changed as well. Most of you probably don't know Dick. He's one of those unsung heroes, always self-effacing. But I can think of few people in Southern California over the last decades who have done as much to better understanding between the United States, between Southern California and Asia. I'll just tell you a story or two. One time, the president of USC at that time, Steve Sample, many of you know him, who unfortunately passed away. Steve Sample went with uh, Dick Dropnik to see uh, the prime minister of uh, Malaysia at the time, Dr. Mahathir. 
And uh, Sri Sampo began to explain to Mahathir uh, who we are. And uh, Dr. Mahathir said, well, Dr. Sampo, uh, Dr. Sampo, there's no need for you to say anything. My cabinet is full of these people, what do you call them? Trojans? <laughs> Another time, uh, in case you don't know, the first time USC board went to China was 1978. I just got out of a USC MBA, and so I, didn't, I wasn't invited to the board yet, so I didn't get to go. But in subsequent years, twice, while serving on the board, I went with them. In 1996, we went to Japan, we went to Hong Kong, we went to uh, Indonesia. Again, we went to Dick and said, Dick, we want to meet the president, of, president Suharto of Indonesia. Within two phone calls, Suharto met with us for an hour. Here is a man who is, has done so much for bettering U.S.-Asia relations, and yet most of us don't know him. And that's why Azizadi is so pleased to honor such a person. If only you know the students, the many students over the years that has been under his, uh, his care. And by the way, he is not just a teacher of someone during the term, during the semester, but he stay with them for the life, for life. And many of the biggest CEOs on earth today actually were his students. They learned from him, they benefited USC, and yet they still keep learning from Dick Dropnik. I am so honored to be standing here to present the, pri the, the, the honor to a man whom I am happy to call my teacher. Ladies and gentlemen, Professor Richard Dropnik. Wow. Ronnie, I'm really glad Sherry was here to hear all of that. And my son Greg and my daughter-in-law Nikki. Um, as some of you may know that, that Ronnie Chan flew in yesterday uh, to LA from Hong Kong and it's for the sole purpose of honoring both myself and, and Walter and Shirley Wong that, that uh, Ronnie has come in. And so we're really pleased for that. I'm setting the clock because they said I have four minutes and I want to stay within the rules here. Uh, Ronnie and I worked together a lot. I, I got him to come back to USC and be a guest lecturer for the IBEAR program in 1990. And it said it was his first visit back to USC since he graduated in 1978. And then we got him to be the IBEAR commencement speaker, I believe in 1994. And then we started doing programs in Asia. So our first uh, global conference was done in Hong Kong in 2000, uh, 2001. And, and Ronnie was a tremendous help in putting together the program and finding speakers, uh, including uh, the, the Hong Kong chief executive. And then we did it in 2002 in Shanghai and again in 2004 in Seoul. So I had a chance to work with Ronnie very closely and I really appreciate all the time and energy that he's put into uh, these programs for globalizing USC. Um, let me say a little bit about myself and then I wanna do a lot of thank yous. Uh, I'm sort of a, a person of ones, a man of ones. So I have one wife, uh, and only one. And, and Sherry's been my wife for 40 years. We celebrated our 40th anniversary. Uh, just six weeks ago. I've had only one employer, the University of Southern California. I've been working at USC since January 1976. So, so that's 40 years also. In January, we celebrated 40 years of, uh, of gainful employment at a great institution. And it's been a privilege to, to work at a great research university uh, like USC all this time. Uh, very unusual for Southern Californian, I've had only one house. Uh, we, we, we bought something we loved and we've stayed there and we bought it in 1978 so that's 38 years and we bought it because of Howard Jarvis and Prop 13 uh, which brought down our property bill dramatically and of course the great benefit of staying there is we're paying taxes on the 1978 valuation um, now I have one son and one daughter-in-law uh, Greg and Nikki and they're both USC alumni, uh, 2004 Trojan alumni. And now, with great blessings, we have one granddaughter. 
uh, Charlotte, Charlotte, who's now 14 months old and runs around and uh, keeps Nikki in very good shape to, to chase her around. And being a man of ones is good stuff, but in this one category of grandchildren, I'd love to be a man of twos or a man of threes. <laughs> okay, enough of that. The, the, the Marshall school, school has been a great place to work, and it's an innovative school, it's an entrepreneurial school, and it's an internationally focused school. And, and part of that is due to the effects of uh, our current dean, uh, Jim Ellis. How about a round of applause for Jim? And uh, I've had the privilege of being the IBEAR director. IBEAR is our mid-career MBA program, and I was invited to become the director by the founder, Roy Herberger, uh, after f uh, five years when he moved on to Southern Methodist University to become the dean. And I was able to, over the 12 years that I was the director, from 82 to 94, um, teach, teach uh, 13 classes of IBEAR. So that's about 450 IBEAR students suffered through my macroeconomics course. And as Ronnie said, we re remain friends. And many of them have become very, very successful, uh, not just because of my course, but because of all the courses they've taken and because of their internal drive. And then I, whoops, okay. And then I had the great privilege of being Steve Sample's first vice provost for globalization. And we had many, many good uh, activities and things to do and uh, got to know many of the deans and many of our trustees in working this. And I'll close with just a, a statement, uh, as, as Steve always said, is you have to make the ask. So for those of you who might be in Southeast Asia next week, we have a terrific program, Asia Society, University of Indonesia, and the IBR MBA program called the Pacific City Sustainability Initiative. And uh, we have the Indonesian president's uh, special envoy for the climate change. We have the governor of Jakarta. Uh, we have about 40 or 50 really fascinating speakers from around the region. It's free of charge. Just send me a note. We can get you registered if you want to go. Closer to home on, on June 10th, IBER and JETRO, uh, uh, Japan Export Trading Organization, are doing a seminar on economic uh, integration around the Asia Pacific. And the chairman of JETRO from Tokyo will be here for that. And that's June 10th at the Biltmore Hotel um, in the afternoon, I think, 2 o'clock to 5 o'clock. And that's free of charge. Just re uh, register on the JETRO website. But now, most importantly, on July 14th, we have 57 of our IBEAR MBAs, on average 34 years old, graduating. 35 of them are seeking employment. These are very, very talented people. Extremely talented. Where are the IBEAR sitting? Raise your hands. Okay, so if you're looking for global talent, uh, towards the, later on in the day, talk to them. Thank you very much. Now you give me distinct honor to introduce two people, a couple. I only have two minutes, so I have to split them between the two of them. Many of you know that Walter is the son of Mr. Y.C. Wang. And if you don't know Y.C. Wang, you don't know Asia. Everybody in Asia knows Mr. Wang. He is, his nickname is the king of management in Taiwan. And oftentimes, Voice is one of the richest men, if not the richest man in Taiwan. And Walter is his son. However, some of you may not know that unlike many other sons of wealthy kids, Walter did not grow up as a wealthy boy. He grew up in a very simple way, actually not far from here, and had a very, very, I would even say, lowly upbringing although he had all the right genetics. And he eventually ended up working for his late father. And finally, he bought the company from his late father, as we all know, not only at market price, but at market price plus 10%. <laughs> I suppose the father loves the son so much to make sure that he really know what he's doing, that in spite of the 10% extra, he will still be able to make something out of it and surely, Walter, you made something out of it. And we're delighted that today, Walter, 
is one of the biggest player in the plastic tubing business, and I'm happy to say that he has now expanded also into the mainland of China. When Walter was living and going to school in uh, Taipei for a while, he met this beautiful young lady. The first time he met her, he said, that is the lady. Ladies and gentlemen, that is Shirley Wang. Shirley came from Oslo, a very, very distinguished family. But for some reason, Shirley also grew up like Walter, I may add, like me, in a very, very humble way. They never lost their roots. They know who they are. They've been successful, but they have always give back to society. That is something that we Chinese Americans like to think that it is in our genes, and surely Walter and Shirley is emblematic of that virtue, not only of the Chinese, but indeed of any good people on earth. Let me end by, before calling on them, to tell you a story. A couple of years ago, the then Chancellor, Jean, Jean Blanc, are you here? But anyway, a couple of years ago, go, uh, Al Conicel, the then Chancellor of UCLA, came to me and said, Ronnie, can you help me raise funds in Asia? I said, Al, don't you know that I'm a Trojan trustee? <laughs> I'm raising money for USC as well. Well, to his credit, he raised as much as USC did in the last round of fundraising in a very, very short period of time. And uh, your present chancellor will no longer need to call me because he will soon have a chairman of the UCLA Foundation that is Shirley Wang. Call Shirley. She does magic. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the stage, Walter and Shirley Wang. Ronnie. We're still going to come and look for you to ask for money. <laughs> no, really, thank you, Ronnie, for saying so many nice things. Actually, you know, we are the ones who are most grateful. When we were hit with difficult times, you were there for us. When Walter had cancer and we had to go to Hong Kong, do you know who picked us up? Ronnie did. You know, so we're so touched for all that you do for us. You were always so supportive, so thank you. And more so, I'm... And Walter and I are um, really honored and humbled to be counted as one of your friends. So thank you. Now, we have a lot of speeches. I know, Dick, you said four minutes. Mine's an hour or so. Okay? So here I am. I want to say I am grateful for the opportunity to help and be part of the Age of Society. Its mission to strengthen, understand, and and strengthen the understanding and partnership between Asia and the United States. It resonates really strongly with me, not only because I'm a Chinese American, but because I believe, as many of you do, that all of us, all people everywhere, are connected. Indeed, we are one people. The Asia Society's mission is even more important today, as both the United States and the countries of Asia find themselves at a critical juncture in history. Those of us who straddle both worlds now must work harder than before. We, we must work to ensure that our common future will be shaped by a shared respect for our common humanity. This, is, of course, is what the Age of Society has been doing so well for decades. But its job, as we know, is not finished, as there are always new challenges. For instance, U.S.-China's cooperation has improved greatly, but obstacles in the relationship remain. America is worried about China's increased military spending. In 2016, China estimated to be spending $147 billion, a 7% rise over 2015. But China's military spending is only 25% of U.S. military spending, $585 billion. So, I wonder, if you were the world's second largest economy, would you increase your military capacity for both protection and peacekeeping? Many in the West today may perceive China as an aggressor, 
when in fact, China's history is not one of military conquest. The expansion of Chinese influence and government for centuries was through the strength of culture, not its military. As the Chinese would say, it is a strong Chinese culture that conquered its, converted its conquerors. They all became Chinese, whose territories were then added to make up the geographical China of today. Looking back over China's vast cultural history, one can see that it is not in the Chinese nature to be adversarial. To the contrary, unfortunately, many Americans feel the only way to achieve peace is by having a democratic China. Looking back over America's cultural history, one finds a strong belief in individual liberties. They were achieved through conflict and debate. So it is not surprising to hear some Americans hoping for a public uprising that sweeps away the one-party model. I think China's leaders today are resisting the radical changes that swept through China, like the Cultural Revolution, and embracing a return to traditional harmonious values. Now, coming from my American side, I also believe one-party rule can be dangerous, and America should continue to be the beacon of freedom and an advocate for human rights, transparency, and democratic principles. Furthermore, China should, not, should be careful that we do not have an arms race. So rather, I hope that the US and China adopt a sincere cooperative approach rather than an international rivalry. The US-China relationship does not have to be a zero-sum game. One, one rise does not require another's defeat. The world is only so big. We, can, we cannot escape from each other. We are all in this together. So we must work together to make this harmonious world in business, politics, and ultimately in humanity. Well, we can all sit here and talk about bettering US-China relations or even the incredible efforts of Asia society. We must recognize that the real work starts with us as humans sitting right here today. It is critical that we understand each other and work together. We share the same goals, frustrations, and desires. We all hope our children lead better lives than we did. Let's focus on common, our commonalities rather than our differences. We are all humans in one world. The same sun shines on all of us. The most successful relationships, whether in business, politics, or at home, begin and end with empathy. Thus, I am thankful for organizations like the Asia Society for being, bringing understanding between the US and Asia. I'm thankful for all of you for your willingness to listen and appreciating another's perspective. You are all a bridge for peace, hope, and a better future. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. And of course, as uh, Sherry's husband, I completely agree with everything she said. <laughs> completely. I mean, 110%, okay, 110 Well, I especially agree that after going through four-stage cancer and looking at the meaning of legacy straight in the eye, I recognize life is such a precious and a rare opportunity to make a difference. God did not put us here to live a mediocrity life. We are here to thrive. Yes, we have been created to thrive every single day. To thrive does not mean we are gifted with certain talents, with beauty, wealth, or intelligence. Rather, it means we are made at this very time for a special purpose. We might feel we can fulfill a special purpose because we don't have um, this particular trait, circumstances, or history. I once felt this way. But now I recognize that each of our trials and tribulations, as well as our, our victories, our triumphs, not only makes us who we are, but reveals to us how we can and are expected to further God's purpose. We are exactly where we are supposed to be. And we are to take this opportunity to make a difference. 
despite all our challenges or even ordinariness, we are to store our life stories to make a positive impact. So as I was thinking about my purpose and what I could possibly do, especially since I produce the most mundane product, plastic pipe. Basically, plastic pipe is a round product with two holes, one on each end. <laughs> I saw that pipe can provide safe, clean drinking water to impoverished communities in Africa, to growing cities in China, as well as developed nations like our home here in the U.S. Use of plastic pipe can greatly minimize secondary pollution. And by the way, by the way, lead contamination is a very harmful form of secondary pollution. Unfortunately, our fellow Americans of Flint, Michigan, continue to suffer through this tragedy. Water delivered by plastic pipe can help prevent waterborne diseases, produce higher yielding crops, and provide the good drinking water that is essential to life itself. Working with the UN through Columbia University, Millennium Villages, JM Eagle provided pipe to eight African countries that now have safe drinking water. Their farmers can now irrigate their crops without depending on rain alone. So far, our projects have provided these benefits to over 350,000 people. By the way, these eight projects cost approximately two and a half million US dollars. If you calculate it, it's an average of just $7 per person. These pipes lay will continue to benefit more and more people as time moves forward, bringing the cost per person further down. I am not stating this, stating this to shine a light upon myself or my efforts, but rather to show that something as mundane as pipe, someone as ordinary as me, can affect change. Over 2,000 years ago, there's a Chinese ancient philosopher, Lao Tzu, said, the highest good is like water. He said, water works faithfully and continuously, touching everything and helping everything. It runs quietly and gently, penetrating everything and everywhere. Nothing can resist its influence and can give without demanding anything in return. As a Christian, I am mindful also of the teaching of Jesus, who said that God is the living water. If we are connected to God, a fountain of life will run from our inner selves that will never run dry. Like a tree planted by the water, it will never run dry. I'm pretty sure 2,000 years ago, Lao Tzu was not thinking of plastic pipe. <laughs> but who can say God was not? I want, we want our giving to be like an internal fountain that brings benefit far into the future even possible from one generation to the next. We realize that we come into this world nothing, and we will leave this world with nothing. What we leave in this world is our story. And I know if we wish to, we can make an indelible difference for generations to come. We can all do this, and the change we affect will ripple out through time and distance across generations and continents. It can be our own life story and much more. Because of this, I would like to ask each and every one of you right now, right now, to congratulate the person next to you as they were made exactly the way they are. And they are created for a special purpose. So right now, please say to your neighbor, say to your person sitting next to you that you are awesome and you are wonderful. Awesome and wonderful. Yes, you are each and every one of you 
you are all awesome and wonderful. You are truly all awesome and wonderful. Each and every one of you impacts many around you, and each of you should be celebrated for this. Let us recognize that we are created to be celebrated, for our capacity to make a difference, and life should be celebrated every single day. Thank you for listening. Thank you for supporting Asian society. God bless you, and God bless the world. Thank you. Thank you so much. And now, in culmination of this evening, we are uh, excited to move to present the Arts Visionary Award. To introduce this award, we're going to be welcoming to the stage Asia Chow. Where we like, not only is Asia Chow an international model and the face of Shiseido, which is the provider of the generous gift bags that you will all have at your table. All right. Thank you so much. A little bird told us that just last Sunday, Asia graduated from Columbia. Oh, oh. So in true Asian fashion, we can't resist noting that she's a fashion model with an Ivy League education. Pretty fantastic. So please give a warm, hearty welcome to the stage to Ms. Asia Chow. When I was first asked to present Michael for this, um, I was, of course, very honored um, and also confused because I know Michael is very important and he can ask a lot of amazing people to do this for him. Um, but when I ran into him, he said that the reason why he wanted me to do this was because I am fun, young, and I have the right name for it. I'm, I'm two out of three of those things. Um, I try my best to be fun, but like it doesn't always work out. Um, I think everyone is aware of who Michael is as a museum director and who he is as an influencer for American and, I guess, Los Angeles culture. Um, but I guess I would like to sh think of him in a more personal note. Um, I was trying to think of a specific memory that I could perhaps use, but I realized that it maybe wouldn't serve me as well because I just have a general impression of Michael, um, of who he is as a person, and he is always the same to me. He's someone who is very open and generous, and he's someone who has always made me feel that what I have to say is valuable, um, even when I was a pretentious teenager. Um, and I think that he brings that sense of openness to the museum, and that's what makes him such a wonderful person and director. Um, just his openness allows him to invite different cultures and um, so many different ideas into uh, the museum. And so uh, I'm very honored to present this award to Michael, uh, one of my favorite people, genuinely. Thank you, Asia. Uh, thank you so much, Asia Chow. Um, I might be the honoree, but actually we should be celebrating you. Not just because you're smart and beautiful and graduated from Columbia last week, and not just because it's your name is the only one on the podium, <laughs> but because you are the best that this world has to offer, this new global world, the meeting of East and West, and you are the future that, um, that we have in front of us. Your mom, Asia's mom is Ava, and she's one of my board members, uh, born in Korea, trained in art, and has been a huge force in Los Angeles for culture, for art, for film, for fashion. Uh, her father, born in China, Michael Chow, who's here, who's an architect, a painter, designer. He also knows how to cook. Um, in fact, Michael Chow was the one who taught me 
an important lesson. If you want to raise the value of a culture like Chinese culture, you charge more for the food. <laughs> and it worked. So uh, Asia, uh, you are the future and we're counting on you. Uh, thank you all. Uh, thank you, Tom and uh, Jonathan and, and Brian here in Los Angeles. We should grow the Asia Society here because we are the gateway to Asia. Uh, thank you, Ronnie, Chan, Ronnie. As long as you're going to be supporting the Asia Society, USC, UCLA, now I hear, I think LACMA should be on the list. Maybe, what do you think? <laughs> And also, it's an honor to be here uh, to um, uh, meet Dick and to also have Shirley and Walter uh, in, in this company. I do not belong. But I will just say that I know that when Mr. Rockefeller <clears throat> founded the Asia Society, art and culture was at the core of this idea of understanding civilizations and therefore people. And I knew the Asia Society so well in New York City on Park Avenue, where you could see wonderful collections, and where my friends there who ran the museum would also integrate politics, economics, and global thinking into art, which is what it's all about. Um, and in so many ways, what we do at LACMA, at the Museum of the Los Angeles County, uh, is to promote this understanding of many cultures. I'm, I'm actually honored here that one of my bosses, um, Supervisor Mike Antonovich is here, and he makes sure, he's one person who makes sure that the relationship between Los Angeles County and Asia in both culture and economics is strengthened every day. Uh, also, and I think that's absolutely true, I know where you are, Supervisor. My, uh, my own uh, city council member, uh, uh, council member uh, David Ryu is here, and our neighborhood, I love our neighborhood because I'm excited that when I go to and from home or work that I see as many signs in Hangul and Korean as I do in English. And that makes it more exciting to live in Los Angeles. And it's this idea that we have this modern city, the most multicultural and diverse on earth, I think, sitting here on the edge of the Pacific Rim and in, in, a, in, a, in a world that is very large. I, I notice now that the Asia Society claims everything from the Pacific to the Bosphorus, which leaves out, you know, the minorities of Europe and the Americas. We're inclusive of them too at the museum because we do want to uh, acknowledge this global world and many cultures. You know, the speed of communications and travel have brought us together, but they've also brought our differences together. That can be complicated or that can be exciting, as I would like to think of it. It's never been more urgent, this mission that the Asia Society has. It's never been more urgent in this age where we are brought closer together by travel and technology and economics. Um, I am super optimistic about it. I, I keep thinking we are living and entering this great era of multiculturalism. And it's epitomized by Los Angeles. Uh, the home to the most diverse group of languages and peoples than any other. And what is that, this era of multiculturalism? Maybe it's when our cultural differences not only engender curiosity and study, which is so important, but that they actually become this diversity, this multicultural, and becomes the engine of ingenuity and of innovation because of the collection of so many points of view, so many ideas. And it's that, hopefully, that will save our planet, uh, and will allow us to thrive as, as people. So I'm, I'm very honored to be in the presence of this great organization, the Asia Society, that does so much for all of us as human beings. So thank you very much for inviting me.